Jack. We're going to turn to the next page there, 651, on the Jericho Road.
Sing praises to you and hear messages from your word, Father God. At this time, Lord, we would like to honor uh, your word, our Bible, Lord, and all the truths and all the, the wisdom we can find in it to help us get us through our lives, Lord. We would also like to pray for all the Christians, not only here in this congregation, Lord, but for the Christians all throughout this world, Lord. We ask that you bless and keep them and help our ministries to grow, Lord. And we'd also like to honor uh, the country that we live in, Father God, that uh, grants us the freedoms to gather together and worship you as we as we see fit, Lord. We may not always disagree with what, or agree with what they do, Lord, but uh, we still love our country. This we pray in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Uh, pledge to the Bible. I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will read it in my hand, and to my feet, and the right to my path. I will hide these words in my heart that I might not sin against God. And to the Christian flag, I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag, to the Savior for whose kingdom it stands, one the Savior, crucified, risen, and coming again, with life and liberty for all who believe. And to the American flag, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. To the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you, Tom. It's nice to have the sunlight out today. And uh, we're going to sing Shine, Jesus Shine.
Christian. When I say I'm a Christian, I'm not shouting, I'm, I am clean living. I'm whispering, I was lost, but now I'm found and forgiven. When I say I am a Christian, I don't speak of this with pride. I'm confessing that I stumble and I need Christ to be my guide. When I say I am a Christian, I'm not trying to be strong. My professing that I'm weak and I need his strength to carry on. When I say I'm a Christian, I'm not bragging of success. I'm admitting that I have failed and I need God to clean up my mess. When I say I am a Christian, I'm not claiming to be perfect. My flaws are far too visible, but God believes I'm worth it. When I say I am a Christian, I still feel the sting of pain. I have my share of heartaches, so I call upon his name. When I say I am a Christian, I'm not holier than thou, just a simple sinner who received God's grace somehow. The whole point of us being here this morning is a remembrance and remembering and uh, remembering that Jesus died on the cross for us. And if he hadn't died on the cross and was raised again, we wouldn't have the chance for the forgiveness and uh, everlasting life and uh, all the promises that he's given us. And so that he, he wants us to remember that, the sacrifice he made so it's possible for us to have that kind of life. And another thing, sometimes I think, you know, you've been a Christian for 30, 40, 50 years. And so you look at a new Christian sometimes and you think, well, what an idiot. They can't do anything right. Oh yeah, they can. Think back about all of you. Remember when you first started out, when you first accepted the Lord and the path that you've been on. It's a growing path and a growing relationship our entire life. And we should be humbled every day when we think about the mistakes. We think about all the times God's rescued us. Uh, he's lifted us up. He's forgiven us. And he's wiped us clean. And so we have so much to be grateful for and so much to remember as we partake this morning. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we're so grateful that Jesus died for us. And we just pray, Lord, as we partake of these emblems each Lord today, that we do so remembering what's been done for us. Remembering, Lord, with thanks the opportunities you've given us. And Lord, we're so grateful that, that when Jesus died on that cross, and, and if we just follow him, and, and Lord, that we'll be wiped clean, and we get to start new. And we're just grateful, Lord, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thank
Talk to Derek, and, and uh, sometimes when you have that feeling that you have something prepared out and typed and you're ready to go for the week, and then something just says, I'm going to talk about this instead. So I had one of those moments this morning. I was listening to uh, uh, it's called K Love, it's another Christian radio station. And uh, one of the verses that was read was uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 11, and uh, it reads, Yes, you will be enriched in every way, so that you can always be generous. And when we take your gifts to those who need them, they will thank God. You know, there's a lot of gifts that our church gives, whether it's tithings and offerings. When I think about tithings and offerings, I think about the people in the world that we support that have actually a harder time to worship and to read the Bible and stuff. So for years, I don't know how many years it's been now, with key communications, um, the church has always supported them in so many ways. And the same thing goes with the Sudan countries and other countries. And sometimes I think, and I always kind of correct myself as well, think of those that it's hard for them to worship right now. We're, we're pretty lucky and blessed that we get to be here on Sundays. Down the road in many years to come with my son's generation and other generations, who knows what it's going to be like for us. But we're pretty blessed what we can do and then giving back to those that are really in need to be saved. I think that's an amazing gift. As I said before, each family camp, which is a blessing to all of us, we do miss every year, you know. Uh, Brother Turner, him and I had a different kind of bond together. Um, every once in a while, uh, he knew I loved football, and there was a few times at camp that he'd actually throw the football with me. He would never think of Brother Turner playing with the football, okay? He was the big word of a preacher man. And there were times on evening services, I'll admit, I only got bits and pieces of what he was truly saying, because it was hard. <laughs> but one thing I do remember he talked about, and I know one of you can help me with this, is a passage of praying for those all that are in high places. He always signif signif uh, talked about that in the sermons, and that's something that always came out of the sermons that I always remember. I, I miss that guy a lot. And I know he's still kicking and doing well, but what a great man and what a great ministry that him and John did. So that's one thing about tithes and offerings. Another thing about tithes and offerings is you know, what we do with the, in the community. And I know I've talked about this before, but you know, this last year when we were walking and supporting for those mothers that are, you know, new mothers that don't know their choices, that might be struggling in life, but supporting an agency that helps those younger mothers get along the path so they can keep their child, and it's so important, and that was another ministry. Um, and with that said, you know, we also, you know, support, we gotta have the lights on in the church. We support our amazing minister and our families and a lot of great things. So that's why we always have that reminder. It's not like, you know, when we come to the Lord's table, we remind about Jesus Christ. We also remind ourselves we're a church body and we need to help each other out. And what about the giving part? And I've said this last Wednesday. Um, it brought back memories. There was one Wednesday night um, that was closing out, and Derek and I and a few others had this one family come in looking for blankets. 
we didn't know what to do. And uh, luckily, our women's ministry that's upstairs had some blankets. And then that next Sunday, Derek had it on his heart that we needed to learn about giving, especially to helping those people that are struggling in lives. And the ministry that I believe that has been working very well, we'll talk more about later in announcements for a few things, it's been growing. And those people on Wednesday night, there was a, a couple here on Wednesday night very struggling. And honestly, they talked to Sherry, and they were just so blessed and loved how our church helped them out. So within the church, we have great ties that help others people out. We also have great ministry that can help out others. And it's all about the body of Christ, the, our church body here. So we should be very thankful and blessed for our congregation at this time. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for our church body. We thank you for the blessings that continually go into us each and every single day of our lives. May our hearts always be focused on you to help the church, but then also to help those in need. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, for our announcements this morning, anybody with some great praises today? Lola. I got a text last night from Donna's daughter, Shelby. Yes. Her, her oh, grandson, Mason, who is a freshman in high school, made the baseball team. Well, that's great. So, um, Dawn's uh, daughter and daughter-in-law, Lola, uh, grandson, made the baseball. Any other great praises? Bob and Jenny, how are you feeling? It's great to have you on. Feeling good? Go ahead. Dick was talking about when you're having problems and struggles every day. Turn to him. He will answer. He did. Yes, he did. Amen to that. Mom? Today is Bob Stockton's birthday. Today is Bob Stockman's birthday, so if you get a chance today or this week, give him a phone call and wish him a happy birthday. Any other great praises? Barbara? No, there is a moment there. Okay. All right, we need to pray for Norma. She's not feeling good today. Any other prayer requests that's not in the bulletin? Derek? She ended up being at the hospital for a few more days, um, but she's home now, and she'd probably love to have a phone call. I got one more praise. Um, I wasn't able to make it this Saturday, but I will be making a few for sure. My son had his first basketball game, and uh, him and I had a great talk, and, and most of you know I love basketball, and uh, he had a great day, and he's very cheerful for it. And uh, just uh, continue to pray for him and his mom. They're doing well in Eugene, and uh, I'm very excited for him. And school's going with him pretty good, too, as well. So. All right. Is there any other prayer requests? All right. So with the help of Erica and Sherry and a few others, you know, one of the big, biggest questions is, you know, with, with the people that we've been helping with that are homeless, what are some items that might help and be a benefit for the homeless, to help them out. So let's go over the list. There's a list in the bulletin, and I'll just go over it very quickly. So homeless food donations list. Soups with pop top lids. Everybody know what that is? Because it's hard for sometimes the homeless people to, they can't really unscrew, they don't have a, you know. Yeah, a can opener. 
and they, they, and they need to have, be able to eat them out of the can without having to mix in water. Yep, I agree. Peanut butter crackers, it's got that protein, chicken salad and crackers, you can find those at the dollar store. Yeah. Oatmeal packets, canned fruit with the pop top lids. Uh, small cereal boxes, meat sticks, protein, jerky. Well, not, uh, depends on the jerky, but pepperoni sticks. And the biggest one, I think, and we talked about it, is big handbags. So it's kind of hard. Sherry, go ahead. Not a purse. Yes. Not a purse. Not a purse handbag, but a handbag. <laughs> so our wonderful ladies and gentlemen, whoever go back there to help them out, um, can help them out a little bit better. So that's easier for them to carry. Uh, Non-food items. Uh, underwear, socks, cold weather clothing, especially at this time of the year, hygiene products, feminine products also, laundry detergent, they do need laundry detergent, you know, they do, reusable containers, those are big, baby supplies. You know, one thing I'll mention is uh, our family church there at Central Christian um, Portland, they've been working with the other churches and talking about families. They actually have a ministry over there among the churches for those that are homeless with families. And they've been bringing them in, getting them on the right path, finding the right resources, and then they get themselves out of it and get them back on their feet. So I think that's a great ministry they've been doing. Tarps are big, because guess what? It rains. <laughs> Sleeping bags is important and tense. So here are some ideas that could help us out if you ever would like to donate back to that back room. And it's just another great ministry. Our church has uh, been doing very well. And you know, the best thing about it is we've been loving these people. And I appreciate that. And, uh, and it comes back, honestly, because a lot of these people treat you with respect as well. So it's been going very good. All right, here we go. Ladies Quilting every Wednesday. Singing Creation will be next Sunday evening, led by the Mary Dave or I. Um, Sunday School. Great to see the Sunday School back. Great to see you, Anna, and the kids back there this morning. And uh, Men's Breakfast will be this coming Saturday. At Dish Nurse. Ladies Choir Practice tonight. Yep, Ladies Choir Practice tonight. And uh, is there anything else? All right. David Rutledge, will you leave some prayer and pray for those that are in need at this time? I pray for the morning, Heavenly Father. We're so thankful for the prayer that you travel down upon us and the blessing that we receive from you. We ask at this time that uh, all of us. Many, many days without proper food to eat. Pray that you would be with all of them, give them the courage, and help them to see the light that you can shed upon them and the glory that can come from following the Christian path. special music. Um, Lola will be singing with the uh, piano playing on the organ.
chapter 8. Father, we thank you for your work. We thank you for your guidance to us always. We thank you that you didn't leave us 
us as orphans, but you gave us your spirit. And uh, you're there to teach us everything we need to know. We pray that you look at the word this morning and you'll instruct us once again. Encourage us and correct us and help us to follow you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Judges chapter 8 and starting in verse 24. However, I do have one request that each of you give me an earring from the plunder you collected from your fallen enemies. The enemies being Ishmaelites. All wore gold earrings. Gladly, they replied. They spread out a cloak, and each one threw in a gold earring that he gathered from the plunder. The weight of the gold earrings was 43 pounds, not including the royal ornaments and pendants, the purple clothing worn by the kings of Midian, or the chains around the necks of their camels. Gideon made a sacred ephod from the gold and put it in Orpah, his hometown. But soon all the Israelites prostituted themselves by worshiping it, and it became a trap for Gideon and his family. That is the story of how the people of Israel defeated Midian, which never recovered. Throughout the rest of Gideon's lifetime, about 40 years, there was peace in the land. Then Gideon, son of Joash, returned home. He had 70 sons born to him, for he had many wives. He also had a concubine in Shechem, who gave birth to a son, whom he named Abimelech. Gideon died when he was very old, he was buried in the grave of his father Joash at Orpah in the land of the clan of Ebenezer. As soon as Gideon died, the Israelites prostituted themselves by worshiping the images of Baal, making Baal Pereth their god. They forgot the Lord their God, who had rescued them from all their enemies surrounding them, nor did they show any loyalty to the family of Jerubbabel, that is Gideon, despite all the good that he had done for Israel. So the, uh, the pinnacle of Gideon's faith was when he uh, refused to be Israel's king. Uh, we said about last time, and he reminded them that uh, God was the king. He said, he will rule over you. And, uh, you know, it was a lot of, of temptation, I think, for Gideon. But he did the right thing, you know, he kept God on the throne, and, you know, I, I wish the story ended there. That was, the, that was the end, you know, it had a good ending, but it doesn't. And so out of the same breath, Gideon <coughs> begins uh, his decline when he says, I do have one request, that each of you give me an earring from your share of the plunder. Now, it was the custom for the Midianite men to wear a gold earring. So the Israelites had collected tens of thousands of these earrings, uh, as well as a lot of the other plunder. And after they collected all these earrings, they gave them to, to Gideon. It came to 1,700 shekels, which is about 43 pounds of gold. That's a lot of gold. Now, Gideon didn't give them an explanation as to why he wanted them to give him this gold, but uh, we're told that he made it into an ephod. Now, the ephod, this was part of the clothing that the high priest wore. Uh, it was a, a sleeveless outer vest uh, that came down to your waist. It had a, a breastplate <laughs> that was covered uh, with 12 stones. Each of the 12 stones represented... Uh, one of the 12 tribes, and it had a pouch that contained uh, the Urim and the Thummim. And we're not exactly sure what this is. Uh, many people think they're two stones, but whatever they were, they were used to give yes and no answers so that the high priest, you know, could discover the will of God. He would ask the Lord, and the Lord would give him a, pro uh, you know, give him a reply through the the Urim and the Thummim. So why did Gideon not make this ephod? Well, you know, perhaps it was with good intentions. Maybe he made it as, you know, some kind of uh, 
memorial for what uh, God did for Israel that day. But even if that was true, uh, it was a bad idea. First of all, God had not commanded Gideon to do this. You know, the, the ephod, there was pro a part of the tabernacle. Uh, Exodus 28 makes it clear that the ephod was a unique part of the clothing of the high priest. And that no one else was to have this clothing because it was holy. It was to be set apart for the high priest alone. And so by making us such a holy relic, you know, it kind of set the stage for uh, supernatural behavior, which is exactly what happened. You know, the people began to perceive it as some magical answer to their problems, and they began to worship it. Now, well, it's interesting, but this is kind of like what happened to the, the bronze serpent. Uh, you remember the story of the bronze serpent? Uh, well, in Numbers 21, uh, the nation of Israel was coming out of Egypt, and they were wandering in the, the wilderness. And uh, in verse 4 of chapter 21, it says, Then the people of Israel set out from Mount Hor, taking the road to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people grew impatient with the long journey, and they began to speak out against God and Moses. Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die here in the wilderness, they complained. There's nothing to eat here and nothing to drink, and we hate this horrible manna. So the Lord sent poisonous snakes among the people, and many were bitten and died. Then the people came to Moses and cried out, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray that the Lord will take away the snakes. So Moses prayed for the people. Then the Lord told him, Make a replica of a poisonous snake and attach it to a pole, and all who are bitten will live if they simply look at it. So Moses made a snake out of bronze, and he attached it to a pole. Then anyone who was bitten by a snake could look at the bronze snake and be healed. Now this, this bronze uh, serpent, it was, it was a type. So two things are intersecting here. First, you know, there's judgment in this story. You know, God's bringing judgment on the, the nation of Israel. Uh, they kept complaining. I mean, this isn't the first time they were complaining. They complained about every chapter that you, you go through the book of Exodus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. They're always complaining. Uh, and so at this point, their sin needed to be disciplined, and so God brings them this judgment for their sin. And so these, these snakes were a picture of judgment. Uh, but, it, but it also brings something else because it brings uh, redemption too. Because it says, you know, if you want to have life, if you want to receive healing, just look at the bronze serpent and that he had lifted up in the pole and then you will live. So you will receive life from the death that you're experiencing. Now, um, we said it well back in John chapter 3 that Jesus was talking to Nicodemus and he says that Moses lifting up this bronze serpent on the pole, that that was a picture of him. You know, that on the cross he would be lifted up and he would draw all men to himself. And at the cross you see those two elements uh, as well. You see the judgment because Jesus is taking our judgment. And you see the redemption, because through the cross we are redeemed. So Jesus was judged for our sins on the cross, and when we look to him in faith, as he's lifted up on the cross, we too uh, receive eternal life. Now this bronze serpent, it was commanded by God uh, to be made, you know, God commanded Moses that he should make it and put it on the pole. But what happened was, is that centuries later, um, it actually uh, brought forth a corruption. In uh, the book of 2 Kings, the 18th chapter, uh, we find this bronze serpent popping up again. It doesn't just fade out into history, but here it shows up centuries later. So in 2 Kings chapter 18, it says, Hezekiah, son of Ahaz, Became, began to rule over Judah in the third year of King Hosea's reign in Israel. 
He was 25 years old when he became king. And he reigned in, in Jerusalem 29 years. His mother was Abijah, the father of Zechariah. And he did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight, just as his ancestor David had done. He removed the pagan shrines. He, he smashed the sacred pillars. He cut down the Asherah poles. And he broke up the bronze serpent that Moses had made because the people of Israel had been offering sacrifices to it. And the bronze serpent was called the Hushan. Zechariah trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel. There was no other one like him among the kings of Judah, either before or after his time. And he remained faithful to the Lord in everything. And he carefully obeyed the commands the Lord had given to Moses. So you see the same thing uh, happen to this bronze snake as did this golden ephod that, uh, that Gideon had made. You know, there, there was all this superstition surrounding it uh, that had, you know, some sort of supernatural power. And um, so the, the people gave themselves over to evil. You know, they began to worship it. And uh, so Zachary, or Hezekiah, he cleans house. And um, as Gideon had once done, you know, and so he says, you know, that bronze serpent has got to go. And so, but you can, you can hear the, the, the people, you know, getting defensive about that. They were probably saying, you know, God commanded us to make that. That's Moses's. You can't get rid of that, you know. That's something Moses made. It's a relic. Now, who do you think you are, you know? But Hezekiah, he, he broke it in pieces because... It had once been a symbol for faith, you know, it had been something God had instructed to be made, but now it has become an object of idolatry. And so the same thing is happening with this ephod. And, you know, Gideon, you know, he could have made it uh, to be just a memorial, you know, the victory that God had given him over the Midianites, but it it becomes an idol, and uh, Gideon should have done something about it when that happened. Where is his faith now? You know, as soon as it started becoming an idol, you know, he should have done the same thing that Hezekiah did and just uh, broke it up in pieces or melted it or done something. Now, remember when God first called Gideon? That's what he did. Remember God called him? And he told him to knock down that, that idol of Baal that was in his father's <coughs> yard. And he also broke up the, the shear pole that was there. And he smashed it to bits. And, you know, that's what he should have done now. But now, you know, a lot of times passed. He's older. Where's his faith now? You know, he's grown soft. He's grown old. And he, he refuses to take a stand against this idolatry that's happening. Um, and it says that it even became a snare to his own family. So apparently a lot of his family was worshiping uh, this golden ephod as well. But And you know, maybe, like I said, maybe Gideon made, the, made it with good intentions. Um, maybe he, he made it as a means to discover God's will. After all, you know, the function of the ephod was to find out the will of God through the Urim and the Thummim. And earlier God had spoken to, to Gideon. In the past, and maybe he thought he would do it again through this ephod, but you know, Israel already had a high priest in Shiloh, and God had commanded uh, the worship through Le the Levitical priesthood at the tabernacle. And even if the priests weren't doing their job, which is probably likely because this is a very evil time, but it didn't give Gideon, you know, the right to take, to take things in his own hands. Now Gideon had visited, God had visited Gideon personally, and he'd given him some signs and revelations. Uh, you know, he told him to make an altar to God and to make sacrifices to God. But Gideon's error here is in assuming that um, that special moment, that temporary privilege that God had given him in the beginning, you know, God had not forsaken his priesthood with Aaron. And he had not given it over to Gideon. So he shouldn't have, you know, sought this kind of spiritual position. And uh, if, 
we go outside the boundaries that God has given us, um, there are consequences. And this happened with another king in Israel, uh, King Uzziah. Now, King Uzziah wasn't supposed to be a priest. He wasn't uh, supposed to perform the duties of a priest, but that's exactly what he tried to do. In uh, 2 Chronicles, the 26th chapter, and starting in verse 16, it says, When King Uzziah had become powerful, he also became proud, which led to his downfall. He sinned against the Lord his God by entering into the sanctuary of God uh, of the Lord's temple and personally burning incense on the incense altar. Azariah the high priest went in after him with 80 other priests of the Lord, all brave men. And they confronted King Uzziah and said to him, It is not for you, Uzziah, to burn incense to the Lord. That is the work of the priests alone, the descendants of Aaron who are set apart for this work. Get out of the sanctuary, for you have sinned, and the Lord God will not honor you for this. And Uzziah, who was holding an incense burner, became furious. But as he was standing there, raging against the priests before the incense altar in the Lord's temple, leprosy suddenly broke out on his forehead. And when Azariah the high priest and all the other priests saw the leprosy, they rushed him out. And the king himself was eager to get out because the Lord had struck him. So King Uzziah had leprosy until the day that he died. And he lived in isolation in a separate house, for he was excluded from the temple of the Lord. And his son Jotham was put in charge of the royal palace, and he governed the people of the land. So, you know, even if Gideon's intention was uh, to play this role of the priest like Uzziah, it was in direct violation of the word of God. However sincere Gideon may have been, you know, um, it was a bad idea, and it became a stumbling block to his family and to all of Israel. But Gideon didn't just make this, this golden ephod, he also, um, it, remember last time we studied about how he, didn't, he refused to be king and he didn't want to be king. But as time went on, he started uh, compromising and he started acting like a king. Uh, for one thing, he practiced polygamy, uh, which was practiced by the, the kings, so that they could have uh, lots of sons. And here we're told Gideon had 70 sons. Um, and, you know, every time anybody practiced polygamy in the Bible, it always caused lots of problems. As it does in this story, because uh, Gideon... Uh, not only had all of these wives, but it says that he also had this concubine. And from this concubine was born to Gideon a son who ended up killing all of the 70 sons except for one. And then also Gideon accumulated all this wealth. And both of these things were warned against in the book of Deuteronomy. Chapter 17, verse 7, it says, A king must not take... Many wives or his heart will be led astray, and he must not accumulate large amounts of silver or gold. So Gideon had done both of these things. And uh, the son that was born of the concubine, his name was Abimelech, and his that name means my father is king. So he was kind of doing the the very thing that he had renounced earlier, because he's naming his son my father is king. So what had happened to Gideon, you know, what had happened to this great warrior who'd done all these acts of faith? Well, he'd grown cold, he'd grown soft. And um, it makes you wonder, you know, because you start thinking about why so many times in the Bible as <clears throat> these men grew older, they started losing their faith. Well, I think it's something that happens kind of naturally over time that is, as we grow older in the Lord, sometimes we have to fight harder, you know, to keep that faith fresh and, and vibrant, like the day that we came to Christ. You know, it's 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 easy to slip into kind of just uh, just this neutral place, and you start 
becoming indifferent, you start becoming cold in your attitudes, and we can't live on the faith that we once had. That's one thing. You know, we need to be active now in order to keep that fresh faith alive and strong. And um, if we don't, then we're just going to uh, live off of yesterday's victories. Uh, it's like a lot of Christians who tell old stories of church camp and old stories of redemption and their faith, old stories when they got saved, you know, and started serving the Lord. But what are they doing now? You know, it's, I mean, it's great. Those stories are great when you got saved, but what's happening now in your relationship with the Lord? And, uh, you know, God was, was glad about what Gideon had done previously, how he knocked down those idols, how he had faced the men of his hometown, how he went up against those 135 soldiers with only 300 men, how he chased the Midianites, every last one of them, you know, until they were all captured, how he refused to be made king. But that was yesterday. Right? Where is Gideon's faith now? Uh, when I was growing up, <clears throat> uh, my grandpa helped to, to raise us, and um, he made a great impression on my mind because every morning when I'd get up, I, uh, I woke up and there he was at the kitchen table, and he was, uh, he was looking out his window into the beautiful backyard that he had, and he was always reading the scriptures every morning. And he would often read passages like James or, or Philippians, you know, books that he used to color and mark up in his Bible, and he colored and marked them up so much, you know, I, I think he had them memorized. And so I asked him about it one day, and I said, you know, why, why Philippians, Grandpa? You don't have that memorized by now. And I'll never forget his answer because he said something like, you know, I have to I have to be a learner again. I have to read Philippians with fresh eyes to hear what God wants to speak into my life today. Every day, you know, is a new day to relearn something that you've already learned. And God's word never grows old. And we need to come before him every day and say, Lord, teach me again. And there he was, you know, in his retirement years and coming to the Lord like it was his first day, you know. Ready to receive that same message he'd read a hundred times before, but with a fresh new perspective. Because maybe that had something to do with the day he was about to enter and God wanted to speak a word into his life. And in that sense of freshness, it's so important because it's so easy uh, to see things the way that we've always seen them. And have you ever noticed how not just Gideon, but very few people in the Bible finish well? And it's true of, of believers today in our own lives. I mean, think about Solomon. You know, he had this extraordinary life. He had incredible faith in the very beginning. And God visits him and uh, he gives him a wish, anything that he wants, anything, desire of his heart. And he asks for wisdom. And God says, since you've asked for wisdom, I'm going to give you power and riches as well. And God says to him, you know, I want you to be the one that builds the temple. And so Solomon, you know, builds this incredible a temple of gold and marble and precious stones in Jerusalem. The likes of, you know, we'll never see again until we get to heaven. And have you ever read his prayers in the Bible? There's some great prayers that Solomon prays, especially at the dedication uh, of that temple. His prayers are extraordinary. And you can just see his faith just coming through all of that. And God even renamed him. He renamed him Jedediah, which means beloved of God or friend of God. And yet, in his later years, he turned away from God. And he began to worship these idols of stone. Or think about uh, King Saul. 
When Saul first becomes king, he had so much potential. He was humble. And he won some victories in the beginning for God. And yet, his power and his fame turned into this uh, pride. And he had this rebellious uh, heart against God. And then he started becoming jealous of David. And he, he ended up turning into this very wicked king. Or think about David. You know, he was a man after God's own heart, obedient, faithful, very courageous, you know, his early years, taking on Goliath and all those stories. And yet, in his old age, he ends up committing adultery. He murders a good friend. Why did this happen? Well, David's heart, it turned away from God. Probably because he wasn't Commuting and studying the scriptures anymore. And even after he commits those sins, he still doesn't repent until the prophet comes to him and says, you're the man and you need to change. And then he realizes what he's done and he's, he's broken over it and he repents and God forgives him. But there's consequences from those sins that affect his, his family in many years to come. Why all these great men that fall away? Well, you know, when God gave his people uh, manna to eat in the desert, the rules that he set up regarding manna were very interesting. And there's some great lessons that we can learn from those stories. It was new every morning, but you had to collect it every morning. You couldn't go out on Monday and, you know, collect for the whole week. Anything that you didn't eat on Monday would rot and become full of worms. So you couldn't save today's collection for tomorrow. Every day you had to do that work. And you, you, you thank the Lord for it, and you throw away what you didn't eat, and then you trust that God was going to bring it tomorrow. And uh, so this was something that they did every, every uh, day. And that, this was to give the people two lessons. First of all, you had to trust every day that he was going to provide for you. And I think that that's something that we struggle with because we have all these securities in America, you know, that we don't have to rely on God every day to provide for us. But that was something God wanted them to learn every day, that they have to depend on God. And the second thing is you can't live on the old manna from yesterday. And if you want to ruin your life, live in the past. Because it's how, that's how it happens. And I just want to ask you this morning, are you living off of old faith? When you open up your Bible, are the highlights and the markings in your Bible from a long time ago? Or are they fresh from this morning's devotions? What's taking a hold of you spiritually today? And what can you show as evidence of what you're doing for the Lord today? Verse 34 of our passage today says that the Israelites forgot the Lord their God again, who had just rescued them from the hands of the Midianites. They fell into their old ways again, into evil. And this is a repeated pattern throughout the whole book of Judges. Every time the judge dies, then they go back into the same sins again. They forgot the mercy of God. They forgot the love of God. They forgot the God that was there to rescue them and meet their needs. There's an interesting passage in the book of Philippians. It's a letter that Paul wrote. And in that third chapter, Paul goes through this list of achievements that he had made. He says, I was circumcised on the eighth day. I was from the tribe of Benjamin. I was a Pharisee of Pharisees. And the list goes on. He makes all these lists of all the spiritual achievements that he had accomplished and how he had followed the law of God to the T. And he lays them all out. And then Paul says, forget about all that stuff. Forget about it. Forget about all the great things that you did yesterday. What are you doing for him today? 
He says, forget what lies behind. Press on towards the goal. Yesterday's manna was yesterday's manna, but have you collected his manna today? What bronze servant? What bronze serpent are you carrying around? What golden ephod has turned into a trap in your life? This morning, I want you to ask yourself the question, the question is your, your faith fresh? Are you experiencing his newness every day? That communion, that fresh manna? Or are you living off moldy bread? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth in it, the conviction that it holds. Sometimes, Lord, we need to wake up call. We need to make sure that every day that we are experiencing the relationship with you that we need to have. To commune with you in prayer, to read from your word. You want so much for us to grow in our faith and to become more like you, but if we don't get into your word, if we don't receive what you want to speak into our lives every day, then we're missing out. And we're going to fall into our old ways and our old habits. So Lord, help us, convict our hearts, help us to really strive every day to, to learn and grow be more like you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Brother Derek. We all said, Amen. It's a great refresher. That's right. We not should just go back and eat the old man. We should go back and look at all those scriptures that we used to mark. It's time to move forward and continue to grow into Christ. So we're going to see 204 in the blue book. Please stand 204. Turn your eyes upon Jesus.